We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the three o'clock block here on ThinkTech. And we're talking about global connections. We're talking about uh, Chinese nationals in American universities. Uh, should they be barred from American universities? This is a serious problem. It's a problem for the United States because of our lack of foreign policy. Um, and it's a problem for them, of course. Uh, Chang Wang, the uh, practicing lawyer in Minnesota, graduate of the University of Minnesota, joins us with our old friend, Russell Yu, a practicing lawyer in Hawaii, nay, and who is very familiar with things in China because he, he spent something like 200 years over there. Am I right? Something like that, Jay. <laughs> too long. <laughs> okay, we're going to conduct this entire show in Mandarin, if you don't mind. Ready? Go. Only kidding, only kidding. Okay, so the first, first thing I'd like to discuss is exactly what is the foreign policy of the United States toward China and toward Chinese students. Uh, Russell, why don't you talk about that? Sure. Um, I think the policy of the United States um, since 2016 um, has been one of um, really um, no foreign policy except to really try to um, shut any kind of engagement or dialogue with China. Um, it's not only in just the what the topic we're going to talk about, but many things, the U.S. trade war. Um, now we have the technology war. Uh, and now we're having the whole concept of disengagement. So we've seen a gradual uh, policy that says cut China out. And what's disturbing, Jay, is that um, now that it's, it's pushed to a bipartisan uh, uh, political world in America, where um, things are giving ominous signs, not only of the relationship with China, but also our allies in Europe and around the world. So um, it's, it's a little bit disconcerting that, that it has gone this far, but there's no articulated policy of how we deal with this. Well, let's be optimistic for a minute. Uh, John, can you, can you uh, deal with this? Is this reversible or is this already have sort of traction where this country and other countries are down on China for reasons that are really not valid? Well, before I answer your question, I just uh, want to add one footnote to Russell's comments. Uh, uh, I, I heard these uh, comments from one diplomat from China and one diplomat from the United States from a foreign service. They, when they talk about foreign policy, and they said the foreign policy is domestic policy. So the, the, the purpose of foreign policy is, is what's going to happen in domestically. So we can say that we can we cannot figure out what exactly the foreign policy now you know uh, derogatory, derogatory uh, you know remark towards our allies uh, and then this this very hostile attitude toward China what, what exactly they want they want the, their audience is is inside the United States so that is you know even it appears they have absolutely no strategy no agenda but they do have an audience inside the United States. So here's my full note. Uh, go back to your question, Jay, uh, is that reversible? You know, there is a tendency, you know, if the government does start something and there is a, they're going to uh, go even way, it's like you drive a car, if you hit the brakes, the car will still go on for, you know, maybe 200 yards. So even we change the leadership, you know, earlier next year, and this this entire attitude, all this policy and executive order already in place, you can you can reverse the executive order, but you cannot reverse the entire hostility and a culture inside of certain departments, particularly Department of State and Department of Justice and FBI. So that will go on for a considerable a while. On the other hand, the big environment talk about the, the, the larger picture. You know, there was a newly released uh, pool in all the developing countries, uh, developed countries, you know, Sweden, uh, Australia, Japan, Korea, United States, UK, and look at their attitude toward China and the Chinese. There is a dramatic increasing of the, of the negative view of China in, in the recent years, and it's a very sharp decline of favorable views of China in the, in the recent years. So in the foreseeable future, I would, I would put it about 10 years, eight years mark, you know, this trend will, this overall trend and the overall environment will be pretty unfriendly to China from the oh, US perspective. That's not healthy at all. Um, Sorry. Because, you know, it's not healthy at all. It could lead to uh, fisticuffs 
And so uh, one question I would ask you, looking at all of that, uh, let's suppose um, that we take a fresh look at American foreign policy to China, say in January, say January 20th, for example, uh, what kind of changes would you make? Changes to deal with um, you know, some of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, aggressive maneuvers uh, you know, in the South China Seas, uh, in Hong Kong, human rights, all that. What, what could America do in its foreign policy to make things better between us and between China and the world? I, I would defer this to uh, Russell first, and I, I may uh, add something later. Okay, Russell, your turn. Well, I, th I think I think there is a de-escalation de policy which we should take. Um, uh, again, national security is important as it articulated, but I think a de-escalation meaning that certain areas where we don't like for this immigration topic we're talking about, we we don't take a blanket viewpoint. We take a very nuanced approach. I think um, having a de-escalation, meaning that I think uh, both sides um, will need to start to give up something. For example, um, again, this is one area where uh, uh, just even doing the, the uh, uh, policies restricting immigration and all this. Second is, is again, um, what, what we've been seeing is attack on Chinese businesses, more hostility towards WeChat, TikTok. Uh, again, uh, there may be a better uh, approaches than what's happening now, where we simply have a presidential ban, you know, and say completely get out of here. Uh, you have to do it our way. So again, I think it's using rule of law, more logic, and more engagement. I think the, the word is engagement. A, a very important thing that we are really missing um, through uh, this administration: a lack of engagement. Mm -hmm. Chang, you're, 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 you're nodding. Yes. What would you add to that? Yes, I totally agree with Russell that uh, you know there's a you know, the Obama administration policy was not perfect, but it worked. It worked very well. And the TPP should have worked, but TPP was killed by this administration. So the engagement is uh, 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 largely has been, you know, criticized, but it is is much, much better policy than decoupling and the current, you know, very hostile you know, uh, environment, uh, hostile policy. But on the other hand, there is one thing I do want to point out to the, the current hostility toward China and the Chinese, including Chinese Americans, are really part of the campaign strategy. The GOP uh, uh, circulated a campaign memo in April 2020, uh, 80 pages something. The whole strategy is uh, don't defend the boil down to one sentence, don't defend the Trump, attack China. So that is a part of the whole the whole situation we are in right now, internationally, particularly with relation to China. It's part of the campaign, but a lot of people, you know, inside GOP, they they they, they keep attacking, attacking, and somehow they just forget it's part of the campaign. They they you know if you want to lie, you're going to convince yourself first, right? And so they begin to convince themselves that there is a real enemy. There's a real uh, danger, and they, they kind of forget, they mixed up the campaign rhetoric with their true belief because they do not believe in anything. They don't have, really have an ideology or no principle you know, to, to, to stick to. That's, that's, that's one thing. On the other hand, you look at you know, the human nature. We always you know, pick up some you know, disadvantaged group to blame, you know, have scapegoat. I'm on the board of Minnesota Zoo. So I, I went to the zoo and I talked to the uh, horse keepers. And the horse keeper said, you know, among all the horses, the 20 horses, they almost always, they're going to have one of the weakest horse to be the, uh, to be the uh, you know, all these horses are going to bully him, him or her, the little horse. And even this little horse, even the horse keeper remove this little horse to another area, and they will quickly find another horse, little horse to, to bully to. So this is part, just part of human nature. So now, you know, lucky us, now it's Chinese. You know, a couple of years ago was was the Muslim, now it's just Chinese. And uh, who may, maybe next year gonna be somebody else. And yeah. that, that is a very, very sad situation, but, uh, you know, we have to just accept that. In, in the people just uh, want to have somebody to bully to. I don't accept it. 
right <laughs> thinking people do not accept it. We are better <laughs> than that. General Allen, what Chang has said um, again, and, you know, Chang and I had this discussion previously. And, you know, going back to the Obama administration and Bush administration, Robert Gates, the former Secretary of Defense, um, he coined the whole uh, concept or strategy is, is, is basically the United States should build a high fence around a small yard, meaning that we should selectively pick our little fights and, you know, look at uh, if we're going to do this um, uh, scrutiny of the Chinese, but not do a blanket thing um, again. And this goes to part of um, the prior administration, which uh, was really an engagement, constructive engagement, you know, um, and I think this is part of where we need to untrack and get on that track. What scares me more, Jay, is, is that, uh, again, this is China's uh, year in which they do a five-year plan, uh, okay? And the next five-year plan is, is, is going to be held this month at, at their Congress, and they're coming with the stool circulation policy, okay? Two things they're going to concentrate. Well, one is the domestic economy consumption, but the other thing is, is to rapidly uh, build their um, high tech, okay? This is accelerated brakes on their end, you know, which means that, again, um, it does no good for both sides. We have this uh, thing that's going on, and so China goes in another gear. And, and the question is, then it's harder to deaccelerate later as we go down this road, you know. Um, this whole thing of disengagement will may be impossible, you know. Um, and I think, to me, my personal opinion, as you know, Jay, just living in China, working at U.S. law firms, um, I think really what has been done is they put China back against the wall uh, where as a lawyer, you know that when you litigate, you're going to have to leave some wiggle room for settlement. Um, when you have no room, you're never going to settle. This is what I'm afraid. We're at that crossroad, the most dangerous point of that intersection, where there's no room to negotiate anything. There's no settlement. There will never get something. And so uh, China is the plan B. Uh, and this dovetails in our discussion today, because it means a lot of these intellectuals that would be helping our technical advantage or technical world, uh, China's going to keep them from going. And, and they're going to say, we don't want to go to the U.S. We're going to stay in China, help out this five-year plan. And you know what? There's going to be a big vacuum. As you know, most of Silicon Valley, uh, all of the high tech is built upon a lot of foreign talent. Okay. And this is where we're going to bite ourselves in the foot. Okay. Just because we've gone on this road that there's no point of return. Let's, let's segue to that part of our discussion today. You know, so we have a, a really um, non-functional foreign policy toward China. It's non-engagement and it's, it's a lot of uh, xenophobia and isolationism and nationalism and all the wrong things. And, and of course, uh, just as uh, Chang Wang says, it's, this is uh, uh, for the campaign. This is trying to appeal to Trump's base and, uh, and, and, and tap into that racial hatred that he likes to tap into uh, the base. And so the, the question I put to you is that how does that affect the Chinese students that are here or potentially could come here um, and participate in the American academic world and the American business world, the American world in general. It's mm -hmm. a put off, it, you know, just looking at it from as far as we've gone in this discussion, it's, this is not a friendly place for them. So query, um, you know, how offended are they? How affected are they? Uh, how ticked off are they? Um, mm -hmm. How disappointed are they? I mean, this is the Statue of Liberty doesn't work anymore. So Chang Wang, you know, are you in touch with the academic world? Could you speak to that? Yeah, I can, I, I do can speak. I speak from my personal experience. You know, I came to the United States 20 years ago as an international student on F1 visa. Then for the first three, four years, and I every time I go back to China, not actually the first six years, and I spent three years in graduate school and three years in law school. At that time, before Obama administration, uh, that was under uh, George W. Bush administration, the visa policy is very strict. So every international student, every Chinese student, because of the visa policy is reciprocal. So uh, how many, uh, how you treat, how U.S. government treated Chinese visa applicant will be exactly how the Chinese uh, uh, foreign ministry treated you American visa applicant. So. At that time, the visa, even my uh, pro graduate program was three years. My law school was three years, but my visa is only good for uh, six months. 
So every time I travel, I go outside the United States, either go to Europe or go back to China. I need to go to US embassy to reapply another visa stamp to enter the United States. So that was, I, I, I counted probably I have 15, you know, a visa stamp on my passport. You know, every time I leave, I need to, within, if out of, out of the six months period, I need to reapply. I was determined. I was determined because I, I, I you know, I was um, a student of 1980s Chinese cultural renaissance and it's, uh, it's the closest thing in China compared to the US civil rights movement in the United States. So America is my, is my I just want to study in the United States. I was so determined, I don't mind to wait in line for three, four hours to get another visa stamp. And then Obama administration dramatically improved that. So, uh, and the Obama administration, if you are four, you, you if you are a Chinese student, you're you know, four years undergraduate program. You got you can stay in the U.S. for four years. You can you 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 can you know, travel back and forth without worry about the visa and to be denied entry in the next time or be denied a visa in Europe. That is uh, just a blanket, a blanket. You know, most reasonable reasonable you know visa policy and then we see the you know the the uh, huge increase of the chinese student presence in the united states and then now the chinese students representing i have the number from bbc right now representing about uh 20 percent there are nearly 400,000 chinese students currently in the u.s colleges and universities in 2019 more than one third of the country's international students. Just think about it, one third of the old foreign students are Chinese students. And uh, uh, the Chinese students spent, listen to the number, $15 billion in tuition payment to the US university and colleges. That uh, not including rent and uh, uh, air airline ticket and uh, all the food and, and uh, uh, some school supply, everything we buy. I will not be surprised that if the number easily get to a 20 billion. And the current visa policy toward Chinese students is basically to, to intimidate them to come to the United States to study. You know, not only they are going after STEM students, scientific uh, technology, engineering, mathematics, they are targeting also uh, economic finance students and even political science students. So that so Chinese students, I, I read a lot of reports from the uh, from BBC and from other news outlets in Chinese language and in English language. So the 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 prevailing feeling of the Chinese students in the United States is regret, and there are very few people like me. They are so determined and said, "I just want to be here, and no matter what, you know, I I trust the United States, and uh, I I think." It, it, uh, this is just a, a detour of the uh, uh, United States. But a yeah. lot of students, you know, I hear this quote and I, I give the, you this quote. You know, I hear this quote from Chinese student, students. You know, Obama is what America pretends to be and Trump is America really is. That's a horrible, you know. It is horrible, it is horrible. From the Chinese, not only Chinese students, and not the you actually the Chinese student not uh, is not from him. It's he is quoting some European you know correspondent. So and that is one is regret. You know the, that the feel so sorry he made the wrong choice to yeah. study in this country. Yeah, well, let me the, let me talk to Russell about that. Russell, <laughs> regret. You know this is a, a this is a um, it, it it pierces your heart to think that all these 400,000 students who are here, you know, in good faith, good faith. Uh, trying to learn um, and contributing to the country and the world uh, have regret. So the question is, if, if I give you 400,000 students, Russell, and uh, a good number of them have learned to have regret over the past few years, what does that mean on a macro basis? How do mm -hmm. they conduct themselves differently now that they have understood regret? Well, Jay, I, I think the, what we're going to see is a, probably a really chilling effect, first of all, for 
students coming here. Uh, as, as Sean has mentioned, that's $15, 15 billion. That was in 2018 now, okay? And, uh, and, and that's gonna really hurt us because um, uh, $15 billion, the only other export industry that um, outranks this, outranks education is the aircraft and machinery, like the Boeing planes. So 15 billion is nothing to sneer at. It's interesting because um, this whole effort is a DOJ led effort, not the FBI initiative, it's a DOJ effort. And where's the Department of Commerce? You know, um, again, that's just on the business side. But again, um, uh, what I see getting back to your question is that um, uh, we're gonna see a lot of the students from China possibly going to the European countries. Um, and again, uh, it may never come back here for a while, you know, because of the concern. Um, and as you know, Jay, just seeing the Chinese students in China, most of them have, their whole lives have studied English to get to this point. Their whole lives, the parents have been saving just to get that education. That's the culture, you know. And when it changes, um, it's gonna really be a shakedown uh, for many Chinese who realize that maybe uh, this is not the dream uh, and we're gonna go elsewhere uh, again. So I think it has a, a broader effect, um, just on a, purely on an economic effect for the American side, because um, it is bigger. And, and again, getting back to what I said earlier, the concern I get is that after COVID-19, um, nations are scrambling to look at um, artificial intelligence, uh, digital transformations. And Stanford had a study uh, done in China uh, this May of the top 135 executives that did over $1 trillion of global business. And their thing is, prediction is the Chinese economy, they're gonna go through a digital transformation. And I likewise, in the US, we're behind already. Uh, and we're gonna get uh, all of these kind of skilled talent to actually make our society kick in, to uh, be more digitally connected, to transform um, our country. Uh, because that's where the economic battlefield uh, is headed on a macro level. For us to stay one, number one, if you took in that sense, we need the talent, we need the research, we need innovation, um, and that's so important. Um, by shutting this pipeline, um, they say it, once we shut it down or close it down, it's gonna be another good eight to 10 years before it's gonna restart. Eight to 10 years uh, means of many more years in the business world from a macro point of view. We're just gonna be way behind the curve at this point. Um, just being in China, seeing how they use digital payments and WeChat, and Jay, you've seen that, um, they're like, 10, 15 years ahead of us using QR, QR codes. For example, the success of the uh, controlling the uh, pandemic in China, you had to scan a QR code before you could enter your subway. And that QR code uh, made sure that if you sat next to somebody, maybe 10 feet away in your train, they had COVID-19, the government will find out who sat in this whole area and they will contact you and you would get tested. Yeah, real time um, tracking, that's pretty creative. Right. So, Chang, let me, let me go to you for a minute and, and ask, you know, what is, what is the effect of, of, of this uh, kind of restraint uh, and intimidation of Chinese students? Uh, you know, uh, I keep thinking about Charles Dickens and the Christmas Carol and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this, the story of Christmas future, um, you know, the, the nightmare, if you will, of Christmas future. So mm -hmm. I give you 10 years of this, maybe it can't be reversed, and not right away. Um, the Chinese students, uh, they, like everyone else, they, they see their lives as, as a valuable asset. They have to make a life, make a career, make a family, um, you know, participate in, in, in commerce and the like. What happens to them? What happens to the country? If we intimidate mm -hmm. them to the point, uh, you know, where they have regret and they turn around and they go somewhere else, what happens to mm -hmm. them? What happens to us? What happens to our aspirations, uh, you know, for American exceptionalism? Although that that's a term not in not in legitimate use right now. <laughs> well, uh, part of your question actually was well answered by Russell's comments, and I I, uh, I just agree that every single word he said. Uh, on, on the other hand, let me clarify regret. You know, there are a lot of Chinese students uh, regret they came to the United States instead of Canada or Australia, other English speaking country. But uh, these people uh, are still believe, vast majority of Chinese students and international students still believe in American exceptionalism. 
He believes, you believe America is exceptional. It's not, the reason they came to US instead of Canada, Australia, or the UK, because they believe the United States is exceptional. So there, and on the one hand, there are still a lot of confidence in America, American system by the international students. On the other hand, they're stuck here. They, if they started the program, you know, they're in the second year or in the third year, they can't leave. They can just simply, you know, leave. They're not tourists. They can, they're not visitors. They're stuck here and they are baffled, perplexed, disoriented, you know, scared, you name it, you know. And of course, that is a part of probably this exactly some some administration officials, you know, intention, you know, uh, intimidate you, threaten you, harass you, make yourself deport. If uh, you in the second year, third year, who cares? Go, you go home, go back to China. That is intention. But you, you know, just think, put yourself in their shoes. They can't simply leave. They pay two year tuition, out of state tuition. Remember, all the international students pay out of state tuition. They don't pay in state tuition. So that is, uh, you know, U of M is about $40,000 a year. You know, most public universities are some, somewhere between $30,000 to $40,000 a year. They already paid. They cannot easily transfer their credit to another university in Canada. So that, so they have to wait and see. So they, they just, uh, you know, that is a very, very sad situation. And I, I, serve, I totally sympathize with them. But on the other hand, what about the, the foreign students, they are not here yet. They are in high school, they're in, uh, preparing for study abroad because in Japan, in Korea, in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in the most, you know, particularly Asian countries, it's a no brainer for middle-class family to send their kids to study abroad. It's just a part of the, you know, you know, the standard is a standard. Yeah, looking, a, for, was, looking for a better life, yeah. yeah uh, and Russell, in, in your notes um, on this, you mentioned an executive order that was particularly troublesome. Can you talk about that? And, and really, and I'll, and I'll be asking Tang about this too, what, you know, what should the United States do uh, to correct the, you know, the, correct the, the errors here uh, in attracting Chinese students. So, but, but let's talk first about the executive order and, and how would you deal with that in a new administration? I think the um, order that was issued May 29th this year uh, by President Trump, it bars the entry of these uh, uh, visas to Chinese students in the US who um, in the graduate level program who have been associated with or uh, with any PRC uh, type of military uh, uh, affiliation, um, and again, it 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 also uh, says that under this order that um, the State Department can use its powers to consider visa revo revocation. Okay, uh, and it can direct the State Department to uh, come up and review immigration measures uh, to deal with this issue. A lot of this is is still right now unclear um, as to the procedure of the State Department. And a lot of gives blanket discretion, you know, to uh, uh, to look at uh, students entering into applying for a visa. Um, and you know, it might be that somebody may have had a past affiliation years ago um, uh, and no longer has any affiliation, uh, and everybody's thrown into the same category. It's a blanket uh, category. Um, there's also question marks as to um, a, a central part of the education. Also, is for the students to get uh, what is called OPT, op optical training, uh, after they graduate. And usually there's a time period that they hear, um, they do research uh, with, uh, with companies, uh, which again contributes uh, to uh, a, a better uh, technology development research for us here. So, so that's the, what the order says, okay? Um, the problem is, is it's, it's too broad. And second of all, um, the question is whether or not uh, there's really justification for this, okay. Um, uh, from what I understand, there are already existing procedures that deals with this. That they did, that this order uh, goes over; it overreaches into it. Um, and so again, um, so the question so is: what, what would you do? What would you do, Russell, to correct the era of this order? I mean, let, let's make you the president. I always wanted you to be the president. Let's make you the president on, on January 20th. What, what is your first action with regard to this executive order? 
Well, I, I think the, the, the problem is uh, the executive order um, that, that, that grants uh, these powers to the State Department to do a revocation of visa for one, um, the vetting process for the visa, especially what Chang has mentioned earlier, um, students cannot leave the country, say it's a holiday uh, of the fact that um, their visa can be uh, uh, rejected, okay, revoked. Uh, so this all this uncertainty is something that we need to remove away. I think going back to um, what we had previously under the Obama and Bush administration would do a, a lot to, to get it back on track, okay? To provide clarity, uh, to provide uh, used existing procedures we have. Um, and, and again, it's resetting the policy back again. I think that's important. Second, uh, I think if it's national security interest, um, I think that the uh, that the government has to work closely with the university to ensure best practices are followed. Uh, for example, there is a um, action brought against a, I believe it, it was a Harvard uh, a professor for being involved in some kind of program with the China side. Again, um, it's it's really having uh, the universities to make sure that they follow best practices of even their own faculty. Uh, uh, so it may not only just be a problem of the Chinese students. Uh, you know, that enter into uh, into the U.S. Um, again, um, it, it seems to me that um, really uh, the problem is, is we're creating this chilling effect. We are also causing, uh, I think, giving us economic problems. And, and, and Chang mentioned something middle, uh, a minute ago about um, many of the students come from middle class families, uh, and this is their lifelong pursuit to get an education in America. And again, um, you know, China middle class is between five to 500 to 700 million, you know. And again, uh, this class, uh, usually uh, people are, are generally coming to America for an education. Uh, and again, uh, again, it, it's just a big market for the US from an economic uh, broader point of view. Um, and I think that that's important. So again, back to the question, I think we need to scale back that executive order. I think we need to go to an acceptable level, what we did before on the Obama administration. And, you know, working with the universities to, to create better practices. Well, the universities, you know, they, they're in trouble financially, especially now. A lot of them are closed. They can't, they can't uh, collect uh, tuition. Um, so they, they need help. And this, this is a source of funds for them. But, uh, you know, we're almost out of time, Chang, and I'd like to ask you one last question. This is not an easy question. Um, you know, we have learned here that American foreign policy uh, translated into, as you mentioned, um, American political policy, American election, election campaign policy uh, really doesn't work very well. And it isn't working well now. But my question to you is, is in a larger sense is we see here this administration taking off after the Chinese in so many ways, so many inappropriate ways. Um, and, and we see, you know, other immigration policies that are profoundly affecting our image in the world, um, you know, as a, as, as a liberal democracy. Um, we, have to, we have to deal with that. We have to recover from that. And my, and my question is, what can we learn from the Chinese student phenomenon that we've been talking about uh, in a larger sense uh, to correct our image in the world, uh, to have immigration policy that works for everybody? not only the Chinese, but every single group, every single individual who would like to find education or sanctuary in this country under the, under the lamp of the Statue of Liberty. Can you talk about that for one minute? I, I'm sorry to limit you that. <laughs> yeah, the one minute I, I, I probably, the, the question to be honest is, I don't have a direct answer to the question. It's so profound. Uh, you know, I still have this you know, a vivid memory of my first time when I, I sat on the, the you know, land of the United States. And I, I, I just, uh, you know, couldn't believe that, you know, I'm in America. And uh, today, I, you know, I'm part of, uh, you know, our, our part of the uh, American community. And uh, I, but I, when I read the uh, report from New York Times, I, I give you the, the title of the report. It's the the, the world look at United States with sympathy, with sympathy. You know, I think it's, instead of regret, sympathy is a better word. You know, the world look at United States 
don't see a leader, don't see a beacon, don't see freedom. They see a failed state. They see a dysfunctional state, and they sympathize with, with the United States. And so, you know, no matter how hard we treat foreign country, foreign students, international students, minorities, the most vast majority of these victims being bullied by us, they still believe in us. So that's something I don't take for granted and should be grateful. You know, there one problem for some of the people in the administration is they never feel grateful for anything and they feel victimized. And it, don't you feel it's so ironic the people in power, they feel they are victim and the real victim, they don't feel you know, uh, hostility. Instead, they feel sorry for the abusers. Yeah. Oh, wow, what a conversation. Uh, Chang Wang, thank you so much for joining us. Russell, thank you for setting this up uh, and coming on again. I hope, I hope we can do another show like this. There's much more to discuss and there's so many things happening worthy of discussion. Russell Liu, Chang Wang, aloha, thank you so much. Thank you.